All right, so the, this is the specimen spotlight section, June 12th, Friday. And the first talk is mine, Paul Mayer, from the Field Museum. And uh, it's entitled, What's in a Name? David Dale Owens Ammonites Opalus, Nomen Oblitum. And I gotta remember to click the slides too. I first noticed this type specimen when one of my interns, Alex Lang, was photographing it as part of a pilot project to test how fast we can digitize specimens. Uh, the specimen attracted my attention, not only because it's really pretty, and you can just barely see some of the iridescent colors uh, that play on this specimen with the original shell material and how it's translucent, and you can see the suture lines below, but also mainly because it was in 1852 this, uh, that it was described by David Dale Owens. That's 42 years before the Field Museum opened their doors. So I was wondering how it ended up at the Field Museum, and I looked up the reference uh, for this specimen, which is entitled Report of a Geologic Survey of Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota, and incidentally of a portion of Nebraska Territory, made under instructions from the United States Treasury Department, Philadelphia, 1852. Now the key part of that title for this fossil is the part that says, and incidentally, of a portion of Nebraska Territory. This is just a small addition to the main report added on because John Evans, uh, a student of Owens, not the, the famous uh, 1700 explorer, um, John Evans was a, charged with leaving supply catches for the Owens party along the Missouri River. And he was able to ex explore much farther up river than anticipated due to the help of a fur company. So Evans collected Ammonite opalus in 1849 on the Great Bend of the Missouri River in the Nebraska Territory, which is located 40 miles downriver from Pierre, South Dakota today. Owen described, uh, Owen described and published photos and illustrations of the suture patterns in 1852 and did a nice job. He did everything he was supposed to do. Um, and I'll take a little sidebar now and just talk about David Dale Owens, who is a kind of a fascinating person. He served as Indiana's, Kentucky's, and Arkansas's first state geologist. His works include 11 volumes of published reports from his state and federal geological survey. He's also responsible for the Smithsonian Castle having that nice dark red color because Owen recommended the dark red Seneca Creek sandstone for the building and selected the quarry himself. Owen was, a collect Owen was a collector. He loved to collect and he amassed a large personal rock and fossil collection and had his own museum in New Harmony, Indiana. I, uh, it's been listed and reported that Owen shipped specimens, I think 18 boxes to the Smithsonian and also specimens to a museum in Frankfort, Kentucky and Little Rock, Arkansas. Some of his specimens also made it to the Gurley Collection, which beca later became part of the University of Chicago's, Chicago's Walker Museum, which then was transferred to the Field Museum, and that's how we got this specimen. When Owen died in 1860, his museum had 85,000 specimens. In 1869, his collection was sold to the state of Indiana and housed at the Indiana University in Bloomington. In 1883, a fire destroyed the, much of the museum, including uh, much of the university, including the museum where his collection was stored. I would be very curious to learn if anyone has any specimens linked to the David Dale Owens collections. I know there's some at the Smithsonian, mostly vertebrates from the Badlands, but I would be really interested in any invertebrates. All right, now back to our story. In 1852, Owens published a description of the specimen in the notes uh, with the, this um, specimen. He writes, and I'll quote, uh, you can tell he's a collector from this. Quote, the specimen of this species from the Great Bend of the Missouri have the, the nacre of the shell in the most exquisite state of preservation and reflect light from the surface in the richest iridescent mother of pearl hues. They afford magnificent cabinet specimens. He's definitely a collector. Four years later in 1856, Meek and Hayden published on a specimen from Montana that is the same species as Owen's specimen, but they named it Ammonitis, Ammonites holli and apparently were unaware of the specimen Owen's published. After this, ammonite holli is used by the scientific community and opalus is not mentioned after 1899. Over the years, the species has been assigned to several different genera and today it is in Rabocerus holli or Rabocerus holli. Uh, then in 1983, A.C. Riccardi declared ammonite, ammonites opalus nomen oblitum. Now no, nomen oblitum is not a Harry Potter spell. However, it's certainly something that Professor Gilderoy Lockhart might have used. What it means is forgotten name. And a name can be declared nomen oblitum if it satisfy, satisfy, satisfies three criteria. First, it has to have a valid name that has not been used since 1899. Second, there has to be another senior synonym, synonym or a more recent name applied to the taxa. 
and that more recent name has to be in common use, widespread use, they suggest in 50 or more publications. So once the name has formally been declared to be nomen oblitum, the disused name is to be forgotten. But as you can see, there's a lot of history, a lot of data, and a lot of information stored in this forgotten name. Thank you. All right, I'm pretty sure we don't have time for questions. So we're gonna move right along to our next talk by Jessica Nakano from the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, Finding Faux Fossils. Awesome, okay. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Jesse Nakano and I am the departmental, tar, department registrar for paleobiology at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. First, I want to start by thanking all the virtual conference organizers who ensured we could still have the supportive community and platform to engage with one another. To start with some background, I have been with the paleo team for over a year now, and during this year, a major part of my responsibilities was continuing the cleanup of very long overdue loans and sorting out the status of specimens in limbo. So these are all problems we all know too well. And now as many of you know, or similar to your own processes, our standard acquisition workflow at NMNH requires the curators must review and approve any specimen um, for acquisition or accession. So what happens when you verify the documentation is, documentation is in order and a curator approves the specimen, however, the specimen turns out to be a fake. So this is exactly the case for the fossil you see here. Um, this prepared trilobite became the catalyst for my professional and personal rabbit hole of curiosity about fake or faux fossils in natural history collections. As I was tasked with cleaning up and figuring out what to do with this trial bite, my collections instincts kicked in and I gathered the paperwork and history to get this logged and properly recorded in our system as an acquire for non-accession. Research told that this fake trial bite was purchased and received over 10 years ago for a possible exhibit, but that fell through when it was reviewed and identified as a fake. Our hands were tied legally and ethically, so we were stuck with it. The specimen was thus added to our pseudo fossil collection, which I did not know we had the time either. So great, more questions arose and more side doors opened. I started discussions with longstanding paleo collection staff about this and received their resources and knowledge about the topic of fake trial bites in general. And to clarify, this is a separate discussion um, from replicas and reproductions. Anyways, um, I found there are informal fossil forums and websites on how to identify fake fossils from Morocco, China, Russia, and elsewhere. I found the only specimen with information on this for the public side is on the trilobite website for American Museum of Natural History in New York. This new knowledge surprised me though, because mainly because of how common it was for specimens like this one to exhibit real trilobite elements that were manipulated and combined to form a fake fossil. I was also fascinated to learn just how an origin or locality history of the specimen could indicate that it was a, was a possible forgery. So my thoughts were, could these fake specimens be utilized for our curators, researchers, and collection staff? Are real elements useful for comparative scientific research? Can a study of fake fossils educate the public and collections professionals about methods of forgery and means to identify fakes through physical assessment? Or pick out what the red flags are in documentation? I had these series of questions because simultaneously I was also working on a similar but not as old legacy acquisition for a large donation of purchased invertebrates. There were initial concerns from the curators and fellow collection staff, all based on their years of experience in paleobiology and their institutional knowledge around the subject. Thus, I found myself thinking about this little guy again. And I thought, how could this specimen and the whole pseudo fossil collection itself be better utilized? Could we benefit from an internal written guide and visuals on this? Could this be an effective teaching tool for collection staff and non-scientists like myself? Even more interesting, I thought, how do other collections professionals manage fakes in their collections? Do other museums and institutions have a pseudo collection or some sort of guide to identify fake fossils? Clearly, as I dug deeper, there were more questions, but there was also a growing interest in me to open or find a conversation with curators and collection staff and educators about these faux fossils. So I decided to add this topic to my list of side projects and deep dives, and the first stop for this project will be reaching out to curators and education staff to gauge their knowledge and thoughts. I realize I am also not an expert on the subject, and I do not have as much knowledge, knowledge as our curators and colleagues do. Those 
those individuals can likely identify real versus altered elements on inverts more readily. However, time is a hot commodity for everyone, so calling on those experts may cause delays or time restraints in properly processing. And therefore, it seems like uh, reviving the use of our in-house pseudo collection was a great opportunity. This idea may be a professional, tele professional development task for me to better understand our pseudo collection, but overall, I think it could still be useful. Um, and now that this spotlight has evolved into a slew of questions and opportunities about fake fossils in our collections, um, but for me and hopefully fellow registrars and collections professionals, this is an uplifting reminder about the intrigue of this profession. Um, it continues to encourage me to learn and to think about the benefits of legacy problems in our collections, to not only work towards end-all solutions, but develop platforms and resources that help us inform each other and educate future generations of collection staff. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, uh, we have no time. We're a little behind, but uh, coming up next, we have a talk by Patricia Couric-Burke from the Milwaukee Public Museum. Elisa Rofian from the Maison Creek Lagerstätte, a story brought to you by citizen scientists. Greetings. I'm here to introduce you to VP3592291.1 and point two, a part and counterpart of a Maison Creek nodule, which arrived at the Milwaukee Public Museum along with thousands of other rocks, minerals, and fossils, and a donation from an ambitious and energetic amateur collector named Robert Callis. Robert grew up in the Beloit, Wisconsin area, which is on the border of Wisconsin and Illinois, and was an avid fossil collector at a young age. After high school, he turned his fossil and rock collecting into a small business supplying teachers and schools with fossils and rock samples for science classes. When he passed away, his inventory was donated to the Milwaukee Public Museum. So in 1987, a semi pulled into the museum's loading dock to unload thousands of specimens. Many of these were nodules from the Maison Creek sites. As some of you may know, the Lake Carboniferous Maison Creek Lager Slot is exceptional for the diversity and abundance of preserved fauna and flora found within the concretions or siderite concretions, which are made of iron carbonate mineral. These nodules need to be split or cracked to expose the fossil within them. The nodules occur in a rock unit known as the Francis Creek Shale that lies above the Colchester coal beds in northeastern Illinois. The Francis Creek Shale is of Middle Pennsylvanian age, approximately 310 million years old. At the time of deposition, the Maison Creek area in Illinois was near the equator and present day continents formed one large landmass. Decades of coal mining removed the overlying shale with its nodules, leaving spoil piles of shale accessible. And this led to a novel hobby, concretion collecting. It became very popular to hunt for fossils, and common names were applied to different uh, animals in the concretions, like the tummy tooth worm. So millions of nodules have been rescued from weathering and reburial by amateur collectors, including donor Robert Callis. The flats of concretions collected by Mr. Callis waited for years before attention was given to cleaning, sorting, and labeling them. In 2012, it was the Maison specimen's time for attention. Two geology students, Justin Calhoun from UW-Milwaukee and Daryl Johnson from Whitewater, 
volunteered to do an initial sort of the thousands of nodules and put them in general groups. Then in 2016, the great sorting began and no sorting hat was involved. A group of knowledgeable volunteers came from the heart of Maison country in Illinois to volunteer to put labels on the group that had been sorted out as animals. These volunteers included Andrew Young, Bruce Lauer, Marie Agnew, and Richard Holm. And Paul Mayer from the Field Museum popped in a few times also. In some cases, these volunteers were able to reunite halves of nodules that had been separated in the sorting. Hundreds of specimens were processed and a few treasures were discovered, including this rare aquatic tetrapod, a likely lysorophan. Only a few samples, examples of this group are known. This specimen should add to the scientific knowledge of the group. The specimen is currently on loan to Carleton University, Ottawa, for study by Arjun Mann, a doctoral student who specializes in permocarboniferous tetrapod evolution with a focus on Maison tetrapods. This specimen, like many in the museums across the world, would have remained undiscovered without the aid of citizen scientists. Thank you. All right, thank you, PJ. Our next question, or our next talk is uh, Chronosaurus and the Woman in the Red Dress by Christina Bird from the Museum of Comparative Zoology, Harvard University. Christina? Thank you. The year is 1931, and geologist William Chavelle accompanied an expedition sent to northeastern Australia by the Museum of Comparative Zoology, hereon referred to as the MCZ. Their mission? to explore the Lower Cretaceous deposits in Queensland. During this expedition, Ralph Thomas, a local resident, contacted Cheville about a large fossil skeleton on his land, only five miles away from where the expedition crew was located. Encased in limestone, a 42-foot-long, short-necked plesiosaur was extracted from the earth, all four tons of material packed up and shipped to Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. The fossil was a Chronosaurus queenslandicus, a large extinct marine reptile that lived during the Cretaceous period and was one of the largest plesiosaurs known to science. Due to limitations in time, energy, and money, the necessary resources were not present to fully prepare the skeleton, leaving Chronosaurus to languish in storage for 25 years. That is, until 1956, when Mr. Godfrey Cabot, a lifelong enthusiast of sea monsters, donated significant funds to pay for not only the preparation of the fossil, but also mounting the specimen for permanent public exhibit at the MCZ. These public exhibits would later become the Harvard Museum of Natural History. With Cabot's donation, Dr. Alfred Romer, the curator of vertebrate paleontology and director of the MCZ, was able to give Chronosaurus its time in the spotlight. The following year, in 1957, Rummer interviewed applicants for several assistant preparator positions at the MCZ, positions made possible by Cabot's donation. One of the applicants was Ms. Constance Dolphin, a recent graduate from Earlham College. Constance didn't have your typical interview, and by her later recollection, she suspected its unique nature is why she was hired. During her interview with Romer, he quoted a lyric from Gershwin's song of Thee I Sing. In response, she sang the remaining lyrics. There they were, singing a duet during a job interview. One year later, Romer worked with a photographer to make a special postcard for the MCZ, featuring the recently mounted Chronosaurus Queenslandicus, accompanied by a woman wearing a simple, sleek red dress. That woman was Constance the assistant preparator Romer hired the year prior. The scheduled model for the photo shoot had to cancel, so Romer, in a panic, came up with a solution. He called down to his vertebrate paleontology preparation lab to ask Constance if she owned a red dress and if she could help with the photo. Today, Chronosaurus queenslandicus is the logo for the MCZ 
and is a visitor destination for the MCZ's exhibits in the Harvard Museum of Natural History. Along with Kronosaurus, this image of Constance standing with it became an icon in its own way. 60 years after the photo shoot in 2018, Constance returned to the museum to visit her old friend. To her surprise, Constance's children, Kenrick and Kirsten, made this visit special by asking the museum's vertebrate paleontology collection and exhibition staff if they could recreate their mother's 1958 photo shoot. During her visit, Constance noticed how different the museum's staff was as about 30 staff stopped by the photo shoot to meet her. She mentioned to her son how pleased she was to see so many women working as scientists at the museum. Vertebrate paleontology has long been a field dominated by men, and the MCZ was not immune to this disparity. In 1958, the gender proportion was greatly skewed towards men, with approximately only one quarter of the museum's employees being women. Within the VP department, Constance was one of two women working with eight men. The gender proportion at the museum in 2018 was more equal, with women slightly outnumbering men. In VP, today, I am one of three women in a four-person team. I saw this postcard of Kronosaurus and Constance early in my career and thought how fantastic it would be to work with fossils as awe-inspiring as Kronosaurus. Today, I'm thankful that I'm living my dream and have the honor of being the steward of Harvard's Kronosaurus Queenslandicus that I admired so long ago. Oh, thank you. Great talk. All right, next up, we have Hannah Contrell from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science uh, with a presentation entitled, Are Those Teeth? An Oreodon Story from New Mexico. Hannah? Hi, my name is Hannah Cantrell, and I work at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, abbreviated as NMMNH, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the Southwest United States, as a paleontology digitization intern. I am also, okay, <laughs> I'm also an undergraduate student at University of New Mexico studying evolutionary anthropology and GIS. I first heard of this specimen in this story from the back of a van during the New Mexico Geological Society Fall Field Conference in the fall of 2019. From Dave Love, who is an emeritus professor of geology for New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. He was so excited to share it with me as soon as I told him I would be starting a position there soon. I was also excited to hear it. I was ready to soak up all of the stories and information I could from these wise, experienced geologists I was with. He, Dave Love, and another geologist from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology discovered the exposed jaw jaws in 2008 in Bosque del Apache, just 18 miles south of Socorro, New Mexico. And Dave Love said, are those teeth? To successfully get a permit, the site had to be visited by an archaeologist from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Albuquerque office. After obtaining a permit by working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, and BLM, Bureau of Land Management, Gary Morgan from New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science visited the site and identified the specimen. It was identified as Merichias major, commonly known as an oreodon, an extinct group of browsing even-toed ungulates. Some current, current examples might be camels or pigs. These oreodonts were endemic to New Mexico that lived 35 to 7 million years ago. Oreodont got its name from the Greek word oreo, which means mountain, and daunt means tooth, so mountain tooth. The first use of this name was in 1869 by paleontologist Joseph Fidey, who thought the ridges on the side of the teeth resembled steep mountain peaks. What makes the discovery even more interesting is that the skull was found on one side of a fault line while the skeleton of the body was found on the other side of the fault line, about one meter higher than the skull. The elements of the skeleton just below the skull were affected by the movement of the fault and were poorly preserved. After getting the specimen back to Albuquerque, it took Dr. J.B. Norton, who was a volunteer at the time, he was a retired pediatric surgeon, several months to carefully pick away sandstone from both the skull and the skeleton block. This specimen is interesting for quite a few reasons, both personal to me and also from a scientific standpoint. 
When the school was fully exposed, the hyoid bones, the bones at the base of the tongue, and the voice box, or the larynx, were found. The larynx was ossified. Both the hyoid bones and the larynx are rarely pres preserved as fossils. Based on this bone-like larynx, it is believed that the species was able to produce loud vocalizations, much like the howler monkey that exists today. This specimen has been the only one of its kind to be found in the Papatosa Formation, which is part of the Santa Fe group, as well as being the largest of the genus Merichias currently known. And lastly, a radioisotopic date indicates a late Miocene age of about 10 million years, making it the youngest oreodon known from New Mexico. This story has stuck with me because it's one of the first detailed collection stories I had ever heard. When I started to get to know Gary Morgan better, I eventually asked him to show me this specimen. When I finally got to see it, the story came full circle. This oreodon is definitely my favorite specimen in the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science Paleontology collection. The stories it shares with us are great examples of the stories that all specimens in natural history collections can tell. And this is why it's important to effectively manage museum collections data to keep those stories around and told for years to come. Thank you all so much for watching. Oops, thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Hannah, great, uh, great story, great presentation. All right, for our next presentation, we have um, Amanda Lawrence from the Smithsonian Na National Museum of Natural History and also one of our helpers today. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, her presentation is entitled, One Tooth, Numerous Questions. Take it away, Amanda. When I was given the opportunity, sorry. When I was given the opportunity to lead my first tour of the National Museum of Natural History's Archaeobiology Collection, I was excited that zooarchaeology was being added to the standard anthropology tour. The anthropology collection is 3.3 million objects, so having a focus plan is crucial for tours. This large collection size means that tours often highlight our ethnology collections. But when a group of high school students visit the anthropology department, I was determined to include archaeobiology. My goal was to give them a brief overview of zooarchaeology and show how museum collections aid scientists with their research. I described how zooarchaeological material is used to help characterize past environments, climate change, and animal domestication. I explained how archaeobiology's um, comparative collection is used to help identify fragmented bones. I plan to finish the tour by showing the students the size and material variety found at various sites. That's when I showed them this tooth. This is a mammoth tooth from a site called Lamb Spring, which is a Paleo Indian site in Douglas County, Colorado. This site is significant because it contains some of the earliest evidence of human life in North America. Expedition, expeditions of this site produced over 2,000 bones from bison, mammoths, and other fauna, as well as numerous stone tools, including projectile points and other Cody complex artifacts. This collection is of interest to archaeologists and paleontologists focused on the late Pleistocene and early Holocene. I then asked the group if they had any questions about the collection, questions that I was not expecting. Is that one too? How did mammoth teeth grow? How many teeth do mammoths have? Did mammoths have baby teeth? How big was a mammoth? How old is that tooth? I did my best to answer these questions and after the tour I did some extensive research on mammoths. But the questions really got me thinking about future tours and how to mobilize the archaeobiology collection. I wish that I could have shown them mammoth mandibles, but they are stored in the opposite side of the Smithsonian's Museum Support Center, approximately two American football field from the ethnology collections. Is there a safe way to temporarily move them for other large objects for tours? Luckily, my colleagues from the paleobiology department had already answered that question, and I am in, and I am in communication with them in getting plaster jackets made for some of the megafauna. This will allow me to move objects without having to touch the actual bone and risk damaging them. This tooth 
helped me rethink how to set up archaeobiology tours. All my questions were answered until I started making this presentation. I needed a photo of this too. I was going to simply take a photo with my phone and place it in PowerPoint and be done until the Arch anthropology collections manager suggested that I get a high resolution photo from our imaging department and attach this photo to the catalog record. This caused a whole new set of questions from orientation of the tooth, how to stabilize it during photos, how many photos should be taken, um, how to set the metadata standards. There's been many conversations on the best way to photograph zooarchaeology and paleontology collections. One tooth is relatively simple, but what about many trays of shells? This tooth has started conversations about data standards and future planning for photographing these types of collections. Who knew that one tooth could cause so many questions? I will conclude this talk by answering the high school students' questions. Is this one tooth? Yes. How did mammoth teeth grow? A new tooth grows from the rear of the jaw and the old tooth is lost from the front. How many teeth did mammoths have? Four at a time with a maximum of six sets. Did mammoths have baby teeth? Yes. How big was a mammoth? 13 feet tall or four meters. How old is that tooth? This tooth has not been radiocarbon dated, but other mammoths found at Lamb Spring have dated to slightly over 13,000 years. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Great job. Um, we're running a little behind, so we'll go right to the next one. Um, Laura McCoy from the Manx National Heritage is here, and she will present the first striped dolphin on the Isle of Man, working collaboratively to preserve it for the, oops, sorry. Um, sorry, to preserve it for the Manx Museum and public. Laura? Are you here, Laura? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, great, thanks, sorry. <laughs> sure, no problem. Hello, my name is Laura McCoy. I am the natural history curator for Manx National Heritage on the Isle of Man. Uh, to give you a bit of context, the Isle of Man is in, uh, in the Irish Sea in between Ireland and the UK. Uh, it's a crown dependency, so it's autonomous from the UK. Um, and it's 30 miles long by 10 miles wide and has a population of 84,000. And that's just to help you get um, to kind of key you into the fact that we are very small um, and our resources are kind of split. And so we often have to work cross departmentally to solve problems because not one institution or place will have all of the kits or all of the means to be able to deal with all problems. So um, in late December 2017, a striped uh, dolphin, uh, Stanella, uh, so, um, oh, I always get this wrong, Kawiru Leo Alba, <laughs> um, what, uh, stranded on the southern coast of the island. And uh, it was still alive. So the local wildlife trust officer and a member of the Department for Environment felt um, farming and agriculture. Um, they turned up, they tried to reflate it, but unfortunately it died. But because it was around Christmas, they decided that they would freeze it in um, the department's uh, freezers and then wait until everyone was back for the new year. Um, so after the holidays, the Wildlife Trust officer, um, a volunteer vet and myself carried out the autopsy. Um, and I um, asked if it was possible to be able to take the carcass for composting because the Manx Museum has uh, extensive, uh, well, it's got um, a very large say whale skeleton, which um, was the, is the only member of that species to wash up on the shores. And that was in 1925. And it's got a couple of other cetacean skeletons on display. So I thought it'd be really great to add this one as a contemporary specimen. So there you can see the picture of it on the, um, in the lab, um, ready for autopsy. Um, there were some more gruesome pictures, but I decided to uh, not include those for the more sensitive. Um, 
And, um, and then after the autopsy, uh, an ex-employee of the museum said that he was willing to let us bury it on his land for composting, which was very kind of him. So I um, uh, got some horse manure together and some hay and layered it up and then left it for um, after it was buried for 18 months. Uh, when I went back um, I, and, and dug it up, um, I, it was more like dolphin soup rather than um, a nice clean skeleton so and it was incredibly uh, smelly so I decided to leave it for a few more months with some fresh manure um, and that did the trick and enlivened the composting process so um, uh, when I came back it was actually really well um, composted and, and really cl clean for want of a better word and not smelly at all so that was a good sign. Um, so I took it back to the museum and um, I washed it. And um, when I looked through the forum and magnum at the base of the skull, um, I noticed that there was some really interesting kind of ossification in the cranial cavity, um, which, you know, and I was thinking, well, the brain's supposed to be there. So what are these bony struts doing through it? So um, I, we don't have anything like a, um, an x-ray machine or anything like that, but um, I wanted to ask um, who did and somebody suggested that the hospital would so I called the hospital and they very kindly let me scan the skull um, in uh, in the hospital and um, and there you can see at the bottom of the, the slide you can see the, the bony strut kind of um, going right through the cranial cavity and um, and I was like oh my gosh this is I, I'd never heard of anything like that before it was really interesting so when I contacted Rob Deville at the UK Strandings Programme at the Zoological Society in London, um, he said that this was quite normal for mature animals of that species, um, and it probably died from a brucella um, bacterial infection, um, which is quite common. Um, unfortunately, we weren't, be able, we weren't able to access the skull um, at the time that we were doing the autopsy, because um, we didn't ha quite have the right kit, but... Um, the uh, but apparently yeah that's quite a common way that those dolphins die um, and then sort of afterwards uh, for the interpretation which you can see on that uh, the blue poster um, so we talked to Manx Whale and Dolphin Watch and um, they are a really great organisation that do a lot of the um, dolphin uh, well, cetacean spotting and, and record recording of dolphin sightings around the coast of which the Isle of Man is really uh, great for um, so they were great in helping with the interpretation and in future that hopefully they'll help with education and outreach. Um, and we even had to get the local language council to help us um, invent a new Manx name for the species because it had never been spotted on the Isle of Man before. Um, there was no, the Isle of Man has um, its own language, um, it's Manx Gaelic. And so they um, invented the name uh, Lemedaya Moatronach. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so so many um, members of, of the island like, all came together and it was really exciting. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the next talk because um, they've uh, got to the stage where they've mounted the skeleton together and that's my next step because I haven't quite got that far yet. But um, I just thought that this was a really great example of interagency co cooperation um, and it's been really great to work with so many different departments and so many people with so many different skills. So, um, so thank you very much for listening to my talk, and um, and I'll look forward to the next one. All right, thank you very much, Laura. Excellent, and we'll go right to the next one. All right, our next talk is by Martha Maria Velez from the California Academy of Sciences, and her talk is entitled "Dwarf Sperm Whale Skeleton Articulation at the Charles Darwin Foundation in the Galapagos Islands." Hello everyone, my name is Martha Velez and I'm a curatorial assistant in the Ornithology and Mammalogy Department at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, California. First of all, thank you for listening to my Spotlight Specimen presentation and I hope all of you are doing well. Today I'm presenting the dwarf sperm whale articulation in the Galapagos Islands. In January 2019, I helped with assembly and reconstruction of a dwarf sperm whale Kogiasima a skeleton that was up on shore in August 2015 on Isabela Island in the Galapagos. 
Even though the distribution of this species is around the world, this was the first specimen that was collected in the Galapagos, and it was very important to have this record visible to the community of the Galapagos Islands. Godfrey Merlin, a naturalist and a resident from Santa Cruz Island, was the person who collected and completed the entire cleaning process of the bones. In the first picture to your left, you can see him here wearing a blue t-shirt next to his wife and the team members from the academy. The bones were in perfect condition and only a few phalange pieces were missing. The Charles Darwin Foundation agreed with Godfrey to display the specimen in the exhibition hall at the Charles Darwin Foundation in Santa Cruz Island and they asked the Academy for help in the articulation process. I was part of the Academy team that traveled to the Galapagos to assemble the skeleton in collaboration with the Charles Darwin Foundation. Our team, consisting of Jack Dumbacher, curator of the Ornithology and Mammalogy Department, Mo Flannery, senior collection manager, and myself. We also had the expertise of Lee Post, who is called the Bone Man from Alaska. He has helped the Academy with articulation of some specimens displayed at the museum, and with his expertise and knowledge, he was the key person in the assembly of this specimen. So the Academy, along with the staff from the Charles Darwin Foundation, especially with Gustavo Jimenez, we spent two weeks assembling the skeleton of the specimen. When we arrived, we carefully transported the skeleton on boat from one part of the island to the Charles Darwin Foundation, where we had set up an articulation lab on the main floor of the visitor center. We first laid down all the pieces of the skeleton on a table to have a visual map of how the skeleton should be. The skeleton consisted of 231 pieces plus teeth. Then we put all the parts together we used specialized epoxies and connected materials like wires to reconstruct this rare well specimen for public display. My days consisted of carefully drilling vertebrae, gluing bones, and casting small missing bones from epoxy clay to create the complete skeleton. In the photo in the center, you can see the, all the team members working in the articulation. In addition to the skeleton articulation, because our project was conducted in full public display, and as the only Spanish-speaking scientist on the team, I often conducted informative talks for the visitors of the Charles Darwin Foundation. I explained the reconstruction process to them, and I also performed demonstrations of echolocation using a tuning fork to show how whales and dolphins listen throughout vibration in the lower jaws. The articulation and the collocation demonstrations went viral in the Santa Cruz community, and every day we had people from the island coming to visit the center. They were amazed and happy to see the specimen that was collected in one of the islands and being built for display in the center. This project was a meaningful experience to me because it provided an opportunity to educate not only the tourists that visit the island, but inform the local community in Santa Cruz about this unique species that is threatened by overfishing, entanglements, and ingestion of plastic pollutants. The last photo shows the articulation of the skeleton completed. I was amazed by the result. It was my first articulation of a skeleton, and I loved the experience. To me, starting with a box with pieces of bones and ending with a beautiful piece of art of almost six foot long well is amazing. The specimen is now on permanent exhibit at the Charles Darwin Foundation Exhibition Hall. If you ever go to the Galapagos, I recommend visiting this place. Thank you. All right, thank you. Excellent talk. We were supposed to have a five minute break, but we're running about five minutes behind, so it nicely anticipated. So I think if it's all right, and break in and let me know if it's not all right, we'll go right to the next talk. All right, I don't hear anything, so that's a good that's sign. A, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm the next person, I think. Excellent. Maura. Maura Flannery. All right, so our next talk is from Maura Flannery from St. John's University, and it's entitled A Juniper in a Carolina Forest. Maura? Thank you. This uh, specimen, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice does this. <clears throat> this specimen is at the um, AC Moore Barium. 
which is at the University of South Carolina in uh, Columbia, which is the largest collection of um, South Carolina plants in the state. I um, taught for many, I'm sorry, I, I really tried not for my throat to do this. So I'm just going to keep going and drive you crazy. Um, I, um, I taught for many years in New York. And three years ago, I um, moved to South Carolina. I am not a botanist, but I have become obsessed with herbaria. And I volunteer in um, the A.C. Moore Herbarium now. And um, one of their best historic, or their, their best historical collection uh, are the specimens of um, Henry Rabinell, who um, was a 19th century South Carolina botanist, originally born in the Low Country. And then in middle age, he moved to Aiken, South Carolina, which is up in the Northwest corner. Um, not close to the ocean at all. And um, it happens to be the town where I now live. And he collected this specimen in September of 1869 in a, um, in a forest. And what he describes at this spot is a virgin forest of pine, oak, etc. And there are no signs of clearing or former cultivation by which their introduction may be traced to hand of man. Strange that the alpine form of a tree, this is a juniperus communis, um, which grows a thousand miles north should be found here. So this is a species um, that the southern range for which is usually New Jersey. And, um, he, there were several of these trees growing there and they are still growing there today. What he saw as a virgin forest became a, uh, a fox hunting milieu when the northern, um, they became a northern colony for what winter colony, Aiken did. And so, um, Rich people bought up all the land after the Civil War, and um, 2,100 acres are now what's called Hitchcock Woods, and it is the one of the largest urban forests in the country. And um, so th there are several reasons I chose this specimen. And one is, like me, it's out of its original milieu. Uh, it's farther south than it uh, should be. Um, also, um, it says something about what Ravenel was doing at the time, which was that he was um, collecting plants to sell them. This is 1869, and uh, he had a plantation, but after the Civil War, he had no money and to, to support himself and his large family. So he had always been interested in botany, had specialized in um, fungi, uh, but then became more of a generalist in order to uh, make some money. And um, he had um, a lot, he was well respected among botanists and an indication of that is the pamphlet that's on junipers that's uh, attached to the specimen. And it's uh, from, uh, it was written by George Engelman and there's an inscription on it to H. Ravenel from the author. So uh, Engelman was one of many people, including Tory and Gray and uh, Edward Tuckerman that he was involved in with. Do I have any more time? Well, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, you have I, about a half a minute, sorry. Okay, great, that's perfect. And um, the last thing uh, that I wanna say is um, one Northern botanist named Thomas Mann in Philadelphia um, 
whom he was in touch with, sent him a loan of $50 so he could start a nursery business, which didn't make it. But, um, and he told him he, it was a loan he didn't consider it had to be repaid. So that was uh, something about the spirit between the North and the South after the war. And um, thank you very much to, for listening to this. Well, thank you. Excellent presentation. All right, moving right along. Our next talk is by Yvette Harvey and Claire Booth Downs from the Royal Horticultural Society. And it's entitled, uh, Yvette will be speaking, and it's entitled The Trials and Tribulations of a Hardy Geranium. Thank Yvette. you, Maura. Thank you, Maura. That was a fabulous talk. Anyway, hello, hey. everyone. I'm the keeper of the Royal Horticultural Society's herbarium, where I preserve the UK's gardening heritage by looking after a specialist collection of dried ornamental plants. And we're based in the United Kingdom at RHS Garden Wisley, one of the RHS's five beautiful gardens, and it's supported by our wonderful members. So I'm sure you've all heard about tulip fever and how fortunes can be made with plants. Well, this specimen has a backstory of the complete opposite, as it lost a Dutch grower a considerable fortune. The plant specimen found in the RHS herbarium is a hardy geranium and its cultivar name is Gerwot. And it also has the trade name of Roseanne. Uh, you may not be aware that horticultural taxonomy has an extra special layer of nomenclature all to itself in the code. Anyway, in the early 1990s, our plant was discovered in a garden. It was a sport from a cross between two taxa, Geranium himalayensi and Geranium molechianum cultivar Burton's variety. And it was grown on by the firm Blooms of Bressinghams, who eventually had enough stock to launch it to the public to great aplomb at the year 2000's RHS Chelsea Flower Show where it caused an absolute sensation and took the show by storm. Well, according to Bloom's catalogue anyway. Our specimen was made from the actual plant launched at the show, one of the many privileges of being the RHS's herbarium. Uh, Bloom's very sensibly obtained a PBR for the taxon, and this is a plant breeder's right. Uh, shortly after this time, a similar cross was made in Holland, and the Dutch grower named the new plant Jolly Bee. And he also got it granted protection by a PVR, which is a plant variety right. And it was duly introduced to the UK by Thompson & Morgan, the seed company, in 2003. Well, we'll roll on to 2006 when both taxa were entered into the RHS's hardy geranium trial, where the judges spotted, or perhaps you'd say they didn't spot to be more appropriate, no discernible difference between the two and reported that they were so alike as to not be distinguishable. Suffice to say, the April 2010 Horticultural Week Trade magazine reported that a court trial had taken place between Blooms and the Dutch grower and concluded that Jolly Bee was the same as Roseanne and was to be removed from the market with immediate effect. In all, this cost the Dutch grower around €200,000, so that's US dollars in legal costs. I suspect our Dutchman wasn't best pleased at this outcome. Anyway, the RHS's herbarium contains specimens of both taxas, that's Roseanne and Jolly Bee, preserved for posterity. And in a short time, you'll be able to judge for yourself when the specimens go online. Uh, this is COVID willing, of course. Or even better, you are all most welcome to come along and see them in person too. So thank you. Oops. Thank you, Yvette. Excellent talk. A wonderful story. Thank you. All right. I will move right along, and we're almost right on time now, um, to our next talk by Paula Barto from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Um, her t uh, presentation is entitled, The Poppy That Means I'm Home. Paula? Hi. What does it mean to be at home in the Anthropocene? My name is Paula Barto. I work at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science as a data digitization intern in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've lived in New Mexico for most of my life. It's the fifth largest state by land mass and the 37th by population, so we're very rural. For me, nothing means home like seeing an Argemon polyanthemus or blue-stemmed prickle poppy, which is why my favorite specimen in our collection is Herb 2782, which you can see here. 
Argemon is a genus in the family Papaversi. Argemon poppies, or prickle poppies, are visually distinct with blue-green stems and leaves that are covered in spines. They have very large white flowers with bright yellow centers for which they've been bestowed the nickname Cowboy's Fried Eggs. We think of home for this genus as being the southern part of the North American continent, so the southwestern United States, Mexico, and the surrounding islands as well. However, for these poppies, home just means a hot, dry, high elevation desert which, which exists all over the world. It is often tempting when learning native and invasive plants to fall into a good plant, bad plant dichotomy of thought, which can be helpful when we're learning by giving us an emotional connection to what we're trying to remember. But it's important to remember that all invasive plants do have their native range and that it's very difficult to tell many plants apart with the naked eye and that it's how humans relate to wildlife that causes harm both to us and the environment. For instance, even in their native range, some plants grow very differently in the presence of human activity than they do in its absence. If you took a hike in Catron County, New Mexico, where I grew up, you would probably see some Argemon polyanthemus, mostly in uh, maybe in two or threes, but really right on top of each other, and maybe just one by itself. If you were to drive down the highway in Catron County, though, then you would see fields and fields of them. This happens for three reasons. Argemon polyanthemus thrive in disturbed soil where many plants don't, and they're aliopaths, which mean that they disperse chemicals that discourage other plants from growing near them. And they are also highly toxic and covered with spines, so wildlife and livestock won't eat them, but will eat everything around them. This creates a great visual indicator of where people graze their cattle and are developing land. Now, if we travel a little ways from Catron County into Otero County, New Mexico, we would encounter a different species, but might not know it. Argemon pinnatisecta is almost identical to Argemon polyanthemus, but it has a much smaller range. They are found in only 10 canyons in the Sacramento Mountains, though they have been uh, only seen in seven of those 10 in the last 10 years. They are reliant on specific pollinators to reproduce and require rainfall to tumble their seeds in the sand and gravel washes where they prefer to grow to scar their seed casings enough for them to sprout. Their primary threat is human activity in contrast with Archimon polyanthemus, to which they are very visually similar, as I stated before. They're also affected by drought and a parasitic mold that is made worse by drought. So their population is now in the thousands, but you would not know that from driving around New Mexico and seeing Argemon polyanthemus in abundance. If we travel south into Texas and Mexico, we would find the native range of another species, Argemon mexicana. And if we traveled across the oceans to India and Africa, we would find the part of the world where most of them grow and are, categor and are categorized as noxious weeds because they do so aggressively. In all of these places, however, Argemon mexicana have become incorporated into traditional medicinal practices for a long time to no detrimental effect. However, in India, uh, they have caused mass poisonings referred to as endemic dropsy. They are cheaper to grow than the mustard crop used for commercial cooking oil. So there have been incidents when suppliers dilute mustard seed oil with Argemon seed oil to turn a better profit, which has poisoned many people. This illustrates, again, that even in similar contexts, it is uh, possible to have very different relationships with a uh, specific species, and that it is the nature of these human relationships that determine the harm they do to us and their environment. Thank you for listening to my talk. Again, I am Paula from uh, the Museum, New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Thank you very much, Paula. Great story. Very interesting. Um, We'll go right on to the next talk. Uh, we have two talks now in a row by Deborah Harding from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Her first talk is entitled Chief Red Clouds War Shirt. Deborah, are you here? Yes, there I am. Move so there's not a sprout coming out of the top of my head. Okay, can I have my picture? Well, okay. Um, First, greetings from the area we now call Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
I want to acknowledge the ancestors and the indigenous people who are, continue to be steward of these lands. This includes, but is not limited to, the people we call Monongahela because we don't know what they called themselves, the Haudenosaunee, the Delaware and uh, Shawnee peoples. Now, I'm sorry, this, I had to sneak into the museum after a lockdown to get the photo of this shirt. So it's not all beautiful, but at any rate, um, if we were in Edinburgh, I would have asked for a show of hands to how many people have heard of Red Cloud. He was born around 1822 and was the most, one of the most important leaders of the Ogallala Lakota from about 1868 to uh, his death in 1909. In 1904, he sold the shirt to a dealer, Pat Ryan, who had purchased a number of things from him previously. This shows how dire things had gotten for him and his family on the reservation because this of the significance of this shirt, it was probably the, one of the last things that he let go. Now, war shirts, also known as hair shirts or scalp shirts, were only worn by those who had earned the right through their bravery and skill and war and were of the highest, highest uh, personal character. Only four men in any one band at a time were permitted to wear such a shirt. Now, you could be a wonderful warrior, a very brave man, but if you had earned one of these things and uh, you had to be honorable, generous, humble, responsible to the community, um, a, a wise counselor, the pious possible character of bringing all the ideals of what a Lakota man should be before you could wear such a shirt. And if you'd earned one and through a lapse of judgment or your character changed, you could be, it could be taken away from you. Now, um, wearing the shirt was such a great honor that the women of a family, I don't know, would pr um, provide the, the hair for these streamers. And uh, the women normally only cut their hair for things like norming, mourning the death of a relative. So you can see it was very important. Uh, we initially, we wanted to exhibit this when we opened the Alcoa Foundation Hall of American Indians in, 18, in 1998. Um, but our Lakota consultants asked us not to. They were afraid that people would think that these, uh, the hair were from scalp locks because like say 90% of people don't read, read uh, uh, label copy. Um, so instead, uh, oh, and Pat Ryan even referred to this as a scalp shirt in the letter he wrote to John Beck offering him the shirt. And uh, we eventually got this from John Beck along with uh, about 12,000 other items. Um, so we could illustrate the tradition of this shirt um, and the warrior status in our exhibit. Um, uh, we used a crow war shirt instead, which had ermine tails and dyed horse hair on it that don't look anything like um, um, human hair. So anybody have any questions? No, don't all jump up one. We had time for one minute very, very quickly. Nope, okay. All right, we'll go to the next talk uh, we got, yeah, so. Uh, oh, you can hear my birds, sorry about that. Yes, uh, they sound like the parrot is a little hungry. <laughs> the parrot's quiet, but the budgies oh. are going nuts. Oh. Okay. All right, then the, Deborah's next uh, talk is entitled The Kaapur Amazon Ritual Necklaces. Very well uh, pronounced. Um, okay. Um, these are two of my favorite pieces in the entire collection, and if anybody ever gets a tour, they have to look at these. Uh, the the Kaapur live in east central Brazil, south of the Amazon River. Um, well, if you can hear my birds, I'm getting rid of this thing anyway. Um, the uh, and they do incredible things with feathers, with bone, with seeds and other portions of animals, everything is done. Uh, all their, their personal adornment is made, is organic materials. Uh, 
I think you muted yourself, Deborah. Crap. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. How did I mute myself? Any rate, okay. Um, these were used in the Ta'i Hupi Raha naming ceremony by the, the uh, Ka'apur people who live in East Central Brazil, south of the Amazon basin. And um, they are, the one on the right is worn by the parents of the child who is going through the ceremony. Um, the, the feathers, you see a, a scarlet macaw feather in the, the uh, bottom pendant there and stuck to it are um, spangled Totinga feathers, Kotinga Kayana. And the, these little black ones sticking out come from the white winged Kotinga, Zephalina lamellipennis, and the beautiful yellow orange feathers along the, the sides come from the channel billed toucan, Ramphostos vitilinus ariel. And it's all stuck together with the gum from the Matakarihu berry tree. So moving on to the left necklace, this is war, oh, that's called Tukaniwa is the uh, um, native name for it. Going to the necklace on the left, this is worn by the shaman who was doing the ceremony called Awa Tukaniwa. It also has spangled Katinga feathers, but here are the feathers of the purple throated, a purple breasted Kotinga, Kotinga Kotinga. These uh, more scarlet macaw feathers and these feathers here with the, the black feathers with the white stripes, we think they're from some species of kite. The bone whistle is made from the tarsus of the harpy eagle, Harpia harpija, and the black on the bone here is from the wax tree, Eriudate glob globulifera. Um, anthropologists don't have to say Latin names very often. So the naming ceremony, all the villagers are assembled and the shaman takes the child from the parents and, re and asks the child's common name that he will be called, he, she, or it will be called daily. Um, and so the, sh the shaman walks around with the child presenting him to the, to the villagers and says the child's name five times. Each time, the, uh, um, he blows the whistle and then the people re uh, repeat the name after him. Then he goes to the ritual sponsors and asks for the child's ritual name. And he repeats the, five times blowing the whistle that the, 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 uh, everybody in the crowd repeats the names. This way, there's no excuse for not knowing who this kid is. You know who his parents are. You know where he falls in society because of who his ritual sponsors are. Um, and when he gets in trouble later when he's grown up, you know exactly where he belongs and you can go to the parents and complain about it. But uh, the idea of having um, ritual sponsors from uh, opposing lineages from a different clan, different group leads to more cultural cohesion because not only do parents have a relationship with people outside of their family, but the child does as well. So questions. I love this piece. No, the colors are just stunning. I, we got oh. about 10 seconds, so no, not really time for a question, but beautiful, okay. stunning colors. Those aerial toucan feathers are sewn, are, are lashed around the tiniest little thread you, you could imagine, and then the whole thing is lashed to the heavier cotton cord that uh, uh, goes around your neck. It's just absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much, Deborah. You're welcome. For our next talk, we have our final talk by Mariano Di Giacomo from the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, who, before I'll introduce her completely, uh, has been a helper and working the social media with a whole crew of people and has really helped make this, uh, if you've heard about this on Twitter or Facebook or any of the other social medias, you have, uh, we have Mariano the thanks, uh, Mariano the thanks, so thank you very much. You've done a great job on that. We wanted to say that beforehand and I completely forgot. So uh, the talk is entitled what do you get when you mix Filipino silversmiths, President Taft, and a giant shell, a massive punch bowl? All righty. Oh. Thank you very much, everybody, for staying until the end of the specimen spotlight. Um, this has been a great session. 
This is a story of a research rabbit hole that I went through when I was a fellow at the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Can I get my slide, Paul, please? Thank you. Um, so one morning we were called by the IZ department and told that there was this punch bowl in the collection. So the conservation team went there and saw this massive, gorgeous punch bowl and all this set that was with it, with the spoons and the trays and all these things that you can see in the bottom image. And we were absolutely just amazed by this. And we started looking at things and I was tasked with the research, which I love doing. So this was amazing. And we found that in the trays, you could read the name Fernando Zamora, 1903 Manila. And that's how we knew that this was from the Philippines. And I started doing some research and trying to find his name and it was hard to find something until I found a report from uh, 1906 in which um, it stated that um, then Secretary of the War Department, William H. Taft, gave this uh, punch bowl to the Smithsonian, which was then a single museum. And um, it was made by Tomas Samora, which is misspelled in the report. Um, and so I said, okay, there is another Samora, maybe it's the same guy with two names, I don't know. We started, continued doing some research and we found in the records that um, this was originally been given to anthropology and anthropology had given it to um, the invertebrate zoology department in 1965. And uh, for a while it was lost to the collection. Um, and so I started digging like, why is this here? Why would Taft give this to the Smithsonian. And I started learning a little bit more about this whole history. So Taft was the governor, governor of the Philippines from 1900 to 1903. And he was tasked with planning the exhibits, the Philippine exhibits for the 1904 St. Louis Fair uh, that was uh, commemorating the Louisiana Purchase. And so he prepared this giant exhibit and this was in the exhibit. And how do we know that? Well, there are reports everywhere. Um, and in, in the right, you can see um, the title, Fine Filipino Handiwork. And this that I found in a newspaper article um, just talks about this amazing piece and the whole set. And it explains which lid goes to which pitcher because there's 12 cups, 12 spoons, a coffee pitcher and a milk pitcher. It's just so gorgeous and amazing. And I kept doing research and I also found um, that both Fernando and Tomas were actually brothers and they came from a family of silversmiths that had won awards all over um, the Philippines. And they were actually the sons of Lola Bacian, which you can see also in that black and white photo. On the left, you can see Fernando. On the right, you can see Tomas. And in the middle sitting there is Lola Bacian, who was also a storyteller in the Philippines and Manila. And so all this rabbit hole of research that I went through um, ended up with a lot of cool history to tell uh, to the IZ department about the history of this object that they own. And then we also found, digging up a little bit more, that when they received this punch bowl, they actually had featured it in their historic and famous um, holiday parties, not with punch, I promise. Um, and so what happened after that is that nowadays the punch bowl is back into the history of the IC department. They have um, just taken it back as part of their own history as well. And um, it has been featured in some of the, of the parties as well as this amazing and gorgeous object that they own. And maybe who knows in the future uh, this can be exhibited, but I know that uh, at least one paper has come uh, from this uh, research since the time when I um, was there uh, analyzing everything that was going on. So it's just a huge amount of history that just contained in one punch bowl and a whole coffee set. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariano. Excellent story and a beautiful punch bowl there. Are, are those little silver wires, are they holding that in or are they broken off or they look They delicate. are uh, algae and it's just this whole scene of the sea. It's uh, mermaids and fish and so this all this gorgeous scene. Um, and we had found some of the pieces detached and here they were uh, attached again because this was also cleaned by a conservation intern. Um, so yeah, it had some pampering after we found it.
Excellent. And thank you again for doing all the social media. How many social media posts have you guys put out? Do you know? I don't know because the tweets uh, vary between um, each post. So each talk, I'm sorry. So a talk can have between one and five posts. It just... there, there must be hundreds then that have went gone. Out. Yes, there's a lot. <laughs> all right. So we now have a 15 minute break and I guess we can open it up for questions. I've been afraid to look at questions and answers or anything because I just want this PowerPoint to run and not do anything goofy. <laughs> So I don't know if um, if uh, Talia or Amanda has anything. I see Deb Paul has her hand raised. Yeah, there's some questions in the um, Q and A. I think they're for Deborah. Um, how old are these naming necklaces? Um, you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. We collected those in 1994 and they were brandy new. So uh, that's pretty much when, when our last collecting was done. Uh, but they, the pendants will come in different colors and they'll different, use different toucans for the side feathers there. But that's my favorite one. I like the spangled katinga more than I like the purple breasted katinga. So. Um, we can also take questions um, if you want to raise your hand, if you have something you want to say and you don't want to type, um, raise your hand and we can also unmute you. Otherwise, um, you can continue to put questions in the Q&A or like Paul said, we'll have a little 15 minute mini break um, if people need to stretch their legs or go get a snack. Right. Uh, After... There's some more questions within the chat and within the Q&A. Any thoughts on how to document these amazing stories um, in our collections records. And I think that's towards Mariana, but probably anyone could chime yeah, in definitely. if they have any questions. Um, or I, think the fact, I think the fact that there's a paper already is already a good sign of documentation that's associated. Um, all of this information, I put together a report and that report was um, uploaded to EMU. So we already have all this information in one single place. Um, I think it was it was very important when we started finding all these things um, because I just show you some of the things that I found, but this was this went to other exhibits and it was shown in other places. There were more uh, newsletter um, articles, so I just clipped everything and put it in a report and put it on email. So having a database where you can connect the record, you know, the sp the specimen with the story, I think it's a very important uh, thing. I would like to comment. I was trying to answer somebody's question online here and I but got lost. Um, the, um, I've been doing research on the organic nature of uh, source for uh, our Amazon Basin artifacts, particularly the personal adornment using the natural history collections and the Ka'apur make necklaces out of anaconda ribs. It is so cool. And I had to go to the herps department and go through and determine whether it was the yellow anaconda or the green anaconda. And you should know it's the, it's the yellow anaconda, no, green. The yellow anaconda is used by another tribe to make this uh, big headpiece for uh, funerals. So it's, it's just great. I love it. Um, Deb, there's another comment slash question for you um, where Gretchen is asking you to tell us about your researcher. Ah, that was, let me discontinue these things here. Um, the, well, we had three different researchers on this one. The, the Ka'apur stuff came from the late Daryl Posey, who worked primarily with the Northern Kayapo in Para State. But um, he got things from other groups from for us as well. We have uh, one of our field associates, uh, research associates, is Michael Heckenberger from the University of Florida, who has been working with the Kuikuru in the Xingu 
and we've, we're, we're working on a grant to try and bring some of them up to tell us about our artifacts that we have in the collection. And the other major collection we have is from uh, Giovanni Sefirio, uh, and that's from the Yana Mamo. He got us most of those things by 1986, I think. Um, all three, well, two of these people are still alive and still help us out. And um, one of the things I had meant to say is that since the fire in the Museo Nacional in Brazil, those three named collections are um, the most uh, complete collections from their groups. And the poor wasn't, did I say that? Was not one of those groups from the well, as well documented, but uh, William Belay, who spent a couple of years living with the Kaapur doing ethnobotany, um, wrote a wonderful book and then came through and looked at our collection and told me all about the ceremony. Well, as long as we got a little break, um, just to let everyone know that uh, Stash will begin at uh, 1030 UTC time, which is 530, well, it's in eight minutes, roughly. Um, and Lisa, I just want to make sure that you want to be the, you're, you're going to moderate that session, is that correct? Um, yes, I believe so. All I'm right. Sure how it works, though, are you going to hand the screen over to me at that point? Do you want to run the slides or should I just continue running? Whichever is convenient. I'm, I'm worried about getting nervous. All right, I'll just run the slides in the background and you can. Okay, does Perfect. that mean speakers have to say next slide? Yes, they will. Okay. So I don't know if, I think all the speakers are on right now and, um, but we'll remind them before we start, yes? Yes, that's a good idea. Okay. Oh. This is more a flannery. I just wanted to tell you how wonderful this session was and how great a job you did organizing it. Well, and thank getting you. us all together and also Talia and Mariana too. But thank you so much. This has been great. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, Talia and, and Mariana and, uh, and Andy uh, are the ones who really did most of the work. I'm, the, I'm just sitting here. Now you put together the slides. I did put together the slides. Yeah, and you selected all the, all the abstracts. The and abstract. you put together the timeline. So don't say that you didn't do anything. Yeah, this was truly a group effort. So I just want to thank everybody again on the organizing committee. The organization of this has been phenomenal. Kudos to everyone. Thank, and thank you. Big thank you. Thank you did a wonderful job. So, so happy about the way it's gone. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. That's good. Yeah, can, can I say thank you, too? It's been real fun, <laughs> even if a bit nerve wracking. <laughs> thank you, Yvette. I, I guess we're always room for more thank yous and praise, but. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a little love fest. Yeah. Don't no, I just. Crashes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not going to crash. Um, I also just want to remind people um, there is an emerging professionals social later this evening. If you're in the U.S. early in the morning, if you're um, in Shelley's time zone, um, Mariana, that starts at 2330 UTC. 2330 UTC. Um, so after the stash, we'll have about a little over 30 minute break. Um, and then it's actually it's in a different room, right? Let me check. Yes, I believe it is. Yeah, it's so a meeting. Actually, it's not a webinar. Right. Um, so yeah, it's a different room. So you'll be able to turn on your videos for that, and they've got some breakout room things yes. planned and some networking activities. So um, and the social. If you don't feel like if you feel like talking about the weather, it's fine. <laughs>
Somebody is saying you can bring your cats. <laughs> and the puppies. Oh, yes. And the puppies. If birds can come, cats can come. Puppies, too. I once had a, a big too. rabbit. Rabbits, did you say? Yeah, someone had a, a giant rabbit. Really? We have a lot of rabbits in our yard. They're very tame, but um, none in the house. This wasn't a wild one. Was just a... Yeah. All right. No questions or anything? I guess I can read the, um, in case you're just joining us uh, for the stash. Um, I don't know what, what the presentations. Stash um, flash. Stash flash, is that it? All right. Uh, let me just read you um, first to uh, say hello and welcome to uh, everyone uh, from the Spinach and ICOM Natural History uh, 2020 virtual conference. This is Friday, for those of you uh, wondering. Uh, session three, this is the second part of session three, and this will be Symposium S5.2 Storage Techniques for Art and Science and History Collections, STASH. Um, and Lisa Goldberg will be your moderator, and her helper is Amanda Lawrence. Um, for anyone from Milwaukee, that I would, my little joke was, uh, let's get ready to sell the M board. That's from the, the Channel 10 PBS auction, but no one will probably get that. Um, this session will be recorded for later viewing. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to all the speakers in this session. I know um, everyone who's joining, it's, it's a difficult time, so we appreciate all the work and, and effort made to, to do anything at this time, so thank you very much. Each presenter will present for five minutes. There probably won't be a whole lot of time for questions, but you can fill in, ask your questions through the Q&A, and uh, after their presentation, they'll be able to answer those, or maybe at the end if there's time. Um, so please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. It's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please use this judiciously, as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Please see our code of conduct document for information. And as I said before, I think uh, the chat and discussion and questions have been really great throughout the, the spinach meeting. So uh, thank you very much. That makes, you know, that's half the meeting right there. Um, please bear with any technical difficulties. Um, hopefully everything will work out smoothly, but you never know. So just be patient. And uh, we may, uh, and the most important thing is sit back and enjoy the session. And right now we have about 213 people in the session. And we should probably start in about one minute. And also for the three other speakers, um, Paul will be advancing the slide. So you'll need to ask him to advance a slide when you're ready. Thank you, I forgot about that already. All right, if you want to start a half minute early, I don't think that'll... That would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, welcome everybody to the third Stash Flash session. Um, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of the site so you're familiar with the resource that we're talking about. Next slide. StashC.com um, catalogs solutions for storage and support of cultural property and creates the potential for electronic communication among users from a wide group of allied um, organizations and professions. Um, creating an online resource of storage and support solutions allows museum professionals from institutions of all sizes and types to access a bank of ideas that may help them in providing better collections care. The creation of the STASH website followed a pivotal AIC initiative to address broader preventive care in the collecting community. In 2011, nine members of AIC coordinated efforts to establish the Collection Care Network, or CCN, as a formal voice for preventive conservation within the organization. CCN is committed to promote, promoting preventive approaches and developing resources for a full range of audiences, from volunteers to seasoned professionals and collaboration with allied professionals was recognized as key in creating a rich, rich and informed projects of which, of which STASH is one. The website was originally built from contact, uh, 
from the content of a book that's now out of print, the 1992 publication Storage of Natural History Collections, Ideas and Practical Solutions. And this year, an updated version of the first volume of the book was published. It's fantastic and I should have included a slide of the cover, but I didn't. Um, it's called Preventive Conservation Collection Storage and is edited by Lisa, Gol Lisa Elkin and um, Christopher Norris and con includes contributions from about 80 authors. Next slide, please. Briefly, the site is divided by storage configurations and its organization can be seen on the left-hand bar. Each larger solution includes a number of smaller subdivisions and each article is organized within the same structure. Next slide. So, for example, containers has eight categories as seen above. The site is specifically organized this way to ask users to think about what they want to do in terms of their storage solution rather than the specific material or object they're looking to store. Next slide. Delving a little deeper, if you go into any of the subcategories, you will see that a list of the articles stored on the site. The articles include the original book con content as well as entries that are added as a result of submissions over the past eight years or so. Um, I should also add here that the website was down for a while this um, spring. It is now back up and we are about a year and a half behind in, in putting entries up. Next slide. So if you open one of the links, you're directed to a specific article. And here's an example of a drop front box. And the article includes um, all the articles include the same parts, um, including materials and supplies, details about construction, et cetera, so that you can modify the solution to your specific needs. Next slide. The site also includes a glossary, and I forgot to mention earlier, it also includes a button for Google Translate, so that the translations are imperfect, but they do allow for multilingual use. Next slide. And we also have a conversion table. Next slide and a list of materials and supplies and tools. Admittedly, this part of the site needs updating, but it's an easy way to cross-check alternative or common names to products like flute, flute board, which is commonly known here in the US as blue board. Next slide. Um, we also have an online submission form, and although we accept and actually prefer um, Word document format um, files with the images received as a separate file. Next slide. The site is supported by FAIC, AIC, and you'll see Spinach's name up there. And we also have an editorial committee made up of a group of individuals in wide ranging allied professions. Um, these volunteer editors help review, edit, and mount your articles on the website. And if you'd like to help work on, an, on the site or contribute new articles, please, please contact us. Next slide. Um, there we go. So today's session has only three papers and the papers are more experimental in nature than in past years. I wanted to introduce the speakers here and then they will be able to speak in turn. Carrie, the first speaker, is a paleontologist and the Paleontology Collections Manager at the Natural History Museum of Utah. She manages over 50,000 paleontological specimens at at the museum, which includes vertebrate, invertebrate, and paleobotanical fossils. Genevieve has been working with herbarium collections at Harvard for 16 years. She has worked across the breadth of herbarium practices and currently works primarily with cryptogamic collections and on integrated pest management. And she's also very active on the Museum Pests uh, Network site. Uh, Marion has a master's degree in conservation restoration, specializing in natural history collections. She's currently a conservator restorer at the Botanical Museum of the University of Zurich and at the Natural History Museum of, um, and forgive my mispronunciations, La Chale de France. During this year, she was also a research assistant in the conservation restoration department at the Hay Arc at, in Neuchatel, New, New, um, Neuchâtel, sorry, Switzerland. And that's all I have to say. Let's, um, let's start with the stash flash sessions. So, Carrie, I think you're up next. Oh, someone asked a question. Could I please post the book details? Absolutely. Um, it is a fabulous book. Okay, so I'm going to type the answer to that question. And if um, Carrie wants to start, that's great. 
guys hear me? Not too well. Is that better? Anybody can hear me? It's That's much better, better, Carrie. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, again, my name is Carrie Levitt Bouzian, and I am the Paleontology Collections Manager at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And I will be sharing with you our earthquake proofing mismatch cabinets. Uh, next slide. So the Natural History Museum of Utah is on the Wasatch Fault, basically, the Wasatch Front, uh, in these beautiful foothills here. And because it is on the Wasatch Fault, uh, seismic mitigation is of utmost importance. But I'm gonna be talking about why it's important to earthquake proof your collections, but it is of uh, utmost importance, you might say great magnitude of importance to uh, um, make sure that your cabinets are structurally sound. The reason we moved forward on this was because I opened a full height cabinet that was stacked on top of another full height cabinet and it almost fell on my head. So that uh, made this very important. So um, next slide, please. So uh, we received a lot of grants for our uh, uh, cabinets, uh, but so most of our collection space has beautiful Delta design, full height cabinets and half height cabinets. And you can see here in this aisle on the right hand side, we have the state of the art pallet shelving, which is pretty awesome. Um, but you can see this last aisle, which is our Eocene and Pleistocene aisle, uh, it has a bunch of mismatched cabinets. Uh, so Paul, if you can go through those, uh, those ones really quickly. Yep, so we have white ones, gray ones, full height ones on top of other full height ones, some on carriages, some uh, that are smaller and some are, that are on wheels. And uh, you might say that uh, when you have uh, cabinets of different sizes, you don't wanna have damage by default. All right, if you wanna move to the next slide, please. So this is what the rest of the collection looks like. Again, those beautiful Delta design cabinets with the half height cabinets above. Um, uh, but I'll tell you how we dealt with the problem aisle. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we met with structural engineers and our facilities people at the University of Utah and their solution was to order these um, uh, metal tubings and cut them to size because of course the bottom of every cabinet that we had was a different size and it had to be custom cut. And so they would cut the tubings to size, then they would drill holes into the concrete, and then they would put uh, epoxy in those holes, and then put bolts in those holes, and then wait for everything to cure, and then uh, put the cabinet on top, drill holes into the cabinets, and then put the bolts and nuts on there, and ta-da, it was done. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you might say that the collections plan was on shaky ground because nothing went uh, to order. So these are metal tubings and they were all cut the wrong lengths. Next one. Um, you might say that there was faulty logic involved because the um, uh, structural engineer uh, had very uh, confusing instructions to the actual installers resulting in, next one. Uh, the bolts all being cut three uh, inches too short. So they all had to be taken back and cut and then brought back. Next one. Uh, they were installed a little bit off kilter, which doesn't look very nice. The next one. Uh, when the concrete didn't actually match up to the bottom of the cabinets, their solution was to slide the uh, washers underneath to fill the gap, which of course in a real uh, seismic activity, it would just shake out. Next one. And you know the whole adage measure twice, cut uh, once, uh, they didn't. Uh, they were off by one inch for this one last one, the last one they put in, which meant that they had to drill holes into the metal tubing uh, and, and kind of shift the cabinet into place. So that wasn't great. Uh, next one. So um, nothing really went as planned, but I'm really glad that we did this. And if I were to recommend to you at your institution to do this, here's how I'd recommend it. I would recommend you would have a committee of the appropriate museum professionals all get together and, and determine where you are now, where you want to go, then get the uh, installers, the facilities installers involved, figure out what their problem solving solutions would be, 
then get the structural engineer involved and figure out what their problem solving solutions would be and the cost and then regroup with the museum professionals in the committee and figure out if that's what you want to do moving forward if that's what if you want to you know if you have a actual cost now if that's how you want to move forward using these mismatched cabinets if we were to do it again we'd probably buy all brand new cabinets um, next slide please so this is kind of the end result we have um, the uh, different mismatched cabinets correctly bolted to the floor we have some half heights up there some full heights on top of full heights but this time they're bolted down which is great and on the right hand side, you can see we have uh, these um, smaller cabinets that used to be on wheels. We remo they removed the wheels, stacked them on top of each other, bolted the bottom ones to the ground and stacked them and bolted them all together. Um, and uh, um, I'm really glad that we did this uh, because, next slide please. Three months later, we had a 5.7 magnitude earthquake hit Salt Lake City and um, 2,000 um, uh, aftershocks after that. And I am convinced had we not done this, um, uh, the cabinets would have fallen down. I was lucky enough to come back into the museum this past Monday and all the cabinets were in place and no fossils were harmed. So that was great. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Carrie. Genevieve? Uh, Tosi from uh, Harvard University Herbarium, curating spirific Basicidio mycites. Are you here? I'm here. Ah, all right. Um, I'm happy to be on video, but it says that I can't unless you unlock me. All right, oh. and I guess maybe here I am. So, um, sporific is not a real word, but I didn't, couldn't come up with a better way to describe um, fungi that just make a giant, giant mess. Anyone who works in mycological collections, I think is familiar with this. Um, so Paul, if you could go to the next slide. So what we have here on the top right is, um, these are all, um, these are both fungi in the genus Podaxis. They are a desert dwelling fungus and it kind of almost looks like um, a mushroom that doesn't open the way you'd expect with gills. And then it's full of a mass of spores. So how do you do that? So in mycological collections, um, in my experience, which is only at one institution, so is limited, um, we haven't historically used what people in conservation and other museum areas would consider classic materials. And in publications, it even says things like, oh, you can wrap this in a chem wipe. Anyone who's familiar with lab practices has probably seen a chem wipe and also knows that it's not actually an archival tool. Um, we also have things like this wrapped in paper towels old Kleenex. Um, people will put them in boxes, which is fine if they're archival boxes, but then if you open the lid, the spores go everywhere. It's a really, really fine powder. So what we have are um, really fragile fungi that have this large volume of spores and packets and boxes. You lose the spores and then polypropylene bags, it's really staticky. And then um, using non-archival material just isn't um, effective in the long run, right? It introduces things that you really don't want to have. And this is all really straightforward to a lot of you, but, um, you know, the, sol the solution, and you're going to laugh at my next slide, the solution um, is really straightforward, I think, if you're someone that's worked with um, ethnographic objects. But I think many of us in herbarium, mycological collections, that's not what we're working with. We're working with fungi. And there's this one, this group that is really messy. So, um, we kind of came upon a solution and we wanted to share it. Um, even though it's very simple, it's much less um, involved than the previous talk. So if you go to the next slide, I only have three slides. So what you see is not archival tissue paper because I was going to prepare this talk and then we got sent home 
for uh, the pandemic. So I had to make do. So what you see is um, a dried culinary mushroom from my cabinet and some cocoa powder, which is not quite the same, but it gives you an idea. So what we've come up with and recommend is using archival tissue paper to create an enclosure for your specimens that um, have a lot of spores that get everywhere. Um, I like to fold it up as you see here. You can either do a triangle fold. I actually find that a twist works better to keep everything in shape. Um, if it's really, really messy, I even double it up. You can cut things to an appropriate size. It's more expensive than using the Kleenex from your desk, but it's not um, exorbitantly expensive. If you have colleagues at your institution, then you can perhaps ask to borrow a piece of tissue paper from them. Um, and it just really allows things to be more stable. And um, I also find that with the twist method, it's, I mean, it seems a little silly, but it actually adds a little bit of rigidity to the end. So then if you're placing it in a box or in a packet, um, you kind of get that extra level of protection. Not all specimens need to be prepared this way, but um, I know that for our institution now, any incoming materials that are gonna be really messy or that we feel this would add an extra layer of protection to, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and I hope that mycologists and mycological collections and other, and other parts of collections that may not have thought of this um, will consider it. And that is all I have. And I'm sorry I didn't have um, more appropriate examples, but um, once we write something to put up on the website, I will be able to go in and take pictures of um, more materials. So thank you. No, I think that was great and, and showed exactly what you wanted. Excellent. Thank you. All right, I think the final talk today is by Marian Dangen. The dis yeah. discoloration of plants in botanical fluid collections, in botanical fluid collections, a challenge for research and conservation. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to um, also to thank every organizers of this conference today. And so I'm going to present you a research project called Fluidis, which deals with the problem of discoloration of plants preserved in alcohol. So um, next slide, please. Um, so um, we are a team of three person working on this subject and it is a partnership between several institutions, namely Botanical Museum of the University of Zurich, Botanical Garden of Neuchâtel, and the Research and Development Department of the Asher Arc Conservation Restoration Institute. So fluid conservation is an old technique but still used nowadays during collecting fields campaign in various countries of the world. The starting point for the study was the observation of the discoloration of some specimen belonging to the collection of the Botanical Museum of the University of Zurich. So this collection is an academic collection built in the end of the 19th century and to the end of the 20th century. The fluid collection presents significant degradation, very representative of the alteration encountered on this type of artifacts. Next slide, please. So the um, practical issue that we wanted to address with this research project is the discoloration of the specimen. This phenomenon is linked to the presence of specific dyes inside certain plant species and their interaction with the preservative fluids, but the involved mechanism have not been yet, uh, have not yet been clarified. So we decided to reproduce samples similar to the specimens present in the fluid collection. We have used different plants species to reproduce the, div the diversity of plants found in museum collection. We wanted to test different fixative and preservative solution, some still, some still in use today, to verify if the discoloration could be due to an uh, to an incorrect procedure for fixing the specimen or to the nature of the plants. So fixation is a process that keeps tissues in a fixed state to prevent them from degrading 
or continuing a biochemical reaction. Next slide, please. So we wanted to determine the influence of the traditional recipes and modern proposals for fluid formulations. With this in mind, we choose two fixative, FAA, a solution of formaldehyde, ethanol, and acid, uh, acetic acid, and formaldehyde, and formaldehyde alone, and four preservative products, so ethanol, 70%, rum, formaldehyde, and glycerol. The latter being the new proposal to avoid this use of dangerous, flammable, or toxic products. As you can notice, formaldehyde is used both as fixing and preservative solution. Next slide, please. So we decided to use different analytical techniques to evaluate the physical properties, the color, and the composition with spectroscopic and chromatographic techniques of the discoloration phenomena. So we carried out a visual control by photographic documentation, taking pictures regularly at one, two, three, and finally to 91 days. In parallel, we carried out color measurements every day during the first five days, once a week during seven weeks, and every two weeks until three months. For this, a portable colorimeter, x right equipped with a stand and a cell for liquid measurements has been used. So we put five milliliters of the preservation liquid were collected for the colorimetric analysis and then put back in the jar. Data are analyzed for color and luminosity comparison. The first ray results show that the discoloration varies according to the type of the plant, the fixing products, and the preservative fluid. There is therefore no miracle liquid that can preserve the color of all plants. With glycerol, a physical deformation has been observed on specimen with a large volume, such as red kohlrabi or paper. Further experiments with this fluid will be performed. To try to understand which components of the plant are extracted and in what quantity, we have also carried out UV spectroscopic analysis with a nanodrop spectrophotometer. With the spectroscopic measurements, samples were taken after three and nine months. Next slide, please. So the aim of this presentation was to show you the methodology that we set up for our project. The method developed for monitoring wet specimen discolorations seems to be adapted to capture the color changes, but it's necessary to do further measurements and evaluate the phenomenon on a longer period, more than three months. And uh, research is still ongoing in and in particular, the exploitation of the spectroscopic data is not finished yet. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Excellent. Lots of information. And I love the, the chart showing the different color uh, and the <laughs> fluids. <laughs> um, we look forward to, um, to hearing what your conclusion is about the best method for preventing discoloration at the end of your project. There were some questions for Carrie. Paul, do we have time? Sure, I think we do. Okay. Um, Carrie, there were a series of questions for you posted by, um, by participants. Um, one was, what scale earthquakes, earthquake were the cabinets um, fitted for? Yeah, so I was trying to answer some questions in the Q&A down there, but okay. um, um, I don't know if they're rated for anything in particular, um, but it survived a 5.7. So I'm sure if you go to Delta Designs, they might be able to tell uh, that. Um, that being said, the half height cabinets that are mounted on the full height cabinets, they're um, uh, attached to one another by screws or screws and bolts, which of course then the envelope seal is gone. With that, their solution was to caulk the holes, um, which is better than nothing, I guess. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'm not sure about the specs on that. 
Okay. Um, and the person, did you collaborate with other museums um, that have this risk? That was a, it was a longer question in the chat, but that's the gist of it. Um, uh, no, not at the time because it was the, the, it was kind of quick movements as much as I wish it would have been more rapid. It was this cabinet almost fell on Carrie. We should get money to do this. We should do this now. And so we, um, I didn't reach out to any other uh, museums to see what they had done there. When our building had been built, we did, uh, uh do some stuff to the actual building. Like there's whole, g gaps, you know, in, in between, uh, where you walk, uh, that have a different metal piece on it. So if the m museum shifted a little bit, it would account for that shifting. Um, but yeah. in terms of, of collection of the collection spaces, it was again, just that one aisle that had been neglected. Okay. Um, and someone asked if you sued them and I, I, you don't have to answer that. The answer is probably no, because you're, you're a university. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, there was, oh, did you install some kinds of straps for oversized shelving to prevent the cradles from walking off during an earthquake? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I'm going to elaborate a little bit in that one of the possible solutions for the cabinets in the beginning was thought to put straps on them and attach them to the wall or attach them to the floor or even attach them up in the I-beams and the ceiling, but they again went forward with the drilling the holes and putting the bolts down method. Um, in terms of the uh, um, open shelving, the oversized collection, our archival jackets, we made them with feet on them and that actually made them really, really stable. And so when I came in on Monday to see what might have broken, um, uh, nothing had moved. In oversized, nothing had shifted, which was um, great. Um, so I, I think having those feet was, was a good idea and the way that we've not really stacked things on top of each other in oversized, they're all just on a pallet um, with their own surface area. I think that helped out. No, nothing walked off their pallets. <laughs> um, and I have a question for you. Did, you. did you call in any engineers from your university to evaluate? Yep, we had one structural engineer on the project. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. That's incredible that you, well, you came up with a solution in a bad situation, which is exactly, which is part of what stash is for so i'm i'm hope i think we can post this somehow and it was put to the test with earthquake that's right um genevieve there's a question for you about um how how durable your um your packets with the um twist ties are have um have you experimented with how the objects did when they were untwisted and examined multiple times um, I answered this a little bit in chat. Um, I know, but I, I prepare. That... I prepare these for um, a researcher needed images of these specimens, so they haven't been heavily loaned, and we really try not to loan these objects. When people need to do destructive sampling, they need spores, and as you can see, there are lots and lots of spores to send. Sure. Um, while doing the work, I was able to untwist and retwist several times, and the tissue paper seemed fairly resilient. But I don't have a long-term case. Um, for other ones, I've folded them up and I've used little the archival plastic paper clips. So I think um, I'm going to look more heavily into what the conservation community actually recommends for this, but this was kind of one of those quick solutions I that mycologists don't think about in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and not all the collections need this sort of work. It's kind of one bigger group that really is a mess. I was saying to a colleague that actually for one of them, I have a I have, I've worked on preparing a specimen to keep it safe that's an older specimen, but I have an entire sandwich size Ziploc baggie full of nothing but spores. Like that's the kind of volume you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And did you put any padding under the tissue paper in the box or container that they were stored in? No. Um, so these were stored, some of them are stored in packets and the packets are kind of heavy um, bond paper. Okay. Um, and then the tissue paper kind of kind of brace that or it braces within the box, but um, the institution I'm in for cryptogams does something unusual that most places do not do. We 
for our paper packets, we actually then use dressmaker pins to pin them to herbarium sheets, and that actually keeps things fairly stable in the folders in cabinets. And if, if you're familiar with herbarium storage, um, and our boxes are in boxes in cabinets. And I do, if um, any objects in the box are a little bit loose, I'll use a little bit of extra tissue to keep them from rattling around. But um, these aren't heavily used collections. Heavily used collections would need a little bit more research, I think. And a conservator in the crowd asked if spores actually stick to the tissue paper. You know, in the little bit I looked, they weren't sticking that much. It wasn't the same sort of staticky thing. We believe I have, um, we have, well, I've got to look again whether we used it buffered or unbuffered because we just borrowed some from um, our um, economic botany collection that has artifacts. So um, it, it, um, it, it varies a little bit, but it wasn't sticking the same way. And I do make sure I kind of almost roll it with folds to then kind of encapsulate those spores because it is, it's, it's really is super fine and super powdery and it'll get in the air kind of like if you have pure cocoa powder or cornstarch. It's very similar to cornstarch in that it will just get everywhere. So I was just trying to encapsulate that to keep it from getting all over the camera stand and all over the camera lens and all over my clothes and all over the desk and the keyboard and the monitor and the cabinet. So that was, that was the goal with this sort of material. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, there is, there are another couple questions for Carrie. Um, I don't know if she answered them. One was if you tried an epoxy seal and the other was, did you, attach rubber shock absorbers to the mounting of the cabinets? Uh, no, no rubber shock absorbers were attached, just metal washers. And um, yeah, I think the epoxy thing is a great idea. Um, I think it's one of those things that I'm gonna have to go back and do that myself. Um, okay. But I'm good at using epoxy, so maybe I'll do that. Okay, well, I think that covers all the questions in the chat, unless anyone ha had other questions. There are three more that are open, but I can't figure out which they are. I think we've answered them all. Any last questions? Anyone? Well, thank you very much um, to all three speakers. And um, we are hoping to get your solutions soon as in article form, um, I will be available to certainly help you shape them if, if they can't easily be molded into the stash um, article format. We always have an option of posting them um, as part of the blog. So thank you very much. Paul? Well, thank you everyone for attending and all the, all the presenters, both in the, the specimen spotlight and stash. I think it was an excellent, a great job. I know these are the some of the most difficult times we may have faced. So um, it was wonderful to see everyone attending and all these great presentations. So thank you very much. I think it was a, a wonderful uh, a sessions, well, two sessions.